Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today for our, the new, our new Sony Video Bootcamp series. This uh, series that we'll be doing every Tuesday for the rest of September. And uh, we're, we have the pleasure of being you know, in, uh, joined by Gene Everett Such. He is a New York based filmmaker who has worked with many celebrities, politicians, and sports teams. Currently, he also serves as a regional trainer for Sony Digital Imaging in the New York metro area. He will be our instructor for today. And uh, hey, Gene. <laughs> hey, buddy. How are you doing? You good? Yeah, we're good. Good. It's always great to see you. Thanks a lot for having Likewise. me. Yeah. Just as a reminder for everyone, we're going like if you miss anything or if you're having trouble keeping along, you can always ask questions. Just make sure to put it in the Q and A portal, uh, not in the chat. It'll help us keep track of what we're we're doing, and make sure we, your question does get answered. And if we run out of, if you want to go back to something, we will be recording this and putting it in our YouTube channel as of tonight. Okay. <laughs> I love how every, all these things are recorded because it's going to be such a great legacy for people all, all the years. <laughs> like, what's that guy talking about? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so 2020. <laughs> great, but uh, thanks a lot for having me. And I, honestly, it's always great to be with Manny. And, and today we get to actually talk about video and video in our Sony system and just how we're going to kick things off a little bit light before we head down the proverbial rabbit hole to kind of get through what we need to do to make sure that everyone out there, at least who's joining us, feels effectively proficient in shooting video, creating, and then maybe we'll skip down the road a little bit to try and, and talk to you a little bit about editing as well. And for those of you who didn't know, Manny actually is a very accomplished cinematographer as well. So we're going to have some, hopefully some really good conversation here. And we've got a little bit of a roadmap to go down so we can at least stay on point and stay on course. I know that every, some of you have some really important questions out there and we want to make sure that we hit everything we can. Because as many workshops as I've ever done, many as many workshops as I've ever, I've ever been to, it's always important to get at least two things out of them that you remember and be like, okay, I'm going to apply this. So with that in mind, did my uh, screen just shift? Yes, it did. Yes, we're on a really good start. I haven't had to break out the smoke signals yet. <laughs> so for those of you that do have Sony cameras and are looking for great sources of content articles that are free and obviously some healthy discussion, from artisans, trainers like myself, freelancers, please visit alphauniverse.com. That's where you find, that is alpha everything centric. So anything up from our point and shoot cameras all the way up to our uh, cinema line. I also encourage you to check out, um, I'm like I said, I'm also a freelancer. So I have a YouTube channel at Gina underscore Everett, I believe it is, or Gina underscore Everett Such or Gina Everett Such, just whatever there but I'm starting to put out some nice healthy Sony content to help people with some real life applications and just how to really kind of get into a deeper dive into customizing your camera. And, uh, and special thanks. I know photo care is uh, very cool about promoting that. And um, yeah. it, it's, it's just awesome. So the, you've got a lot of resources out. It's called the internet and it's us. We're here for you, especially in this lovely time of isolation. And I think it's also a appropriate time that we are talking about video now and usually Manny and I would probably be set up in a classroom somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're on a computer and we are a slave <laughs> to bandwidth. Yeah. So I have tried to minimize a little bit. Usually we have some video heavy content going on where we can show off our latest wares or at least what the capabilities are. I have some little snippets right here, but unfortunately we're gonna probably talk about it a little bit more because we don't want anyone to drag on their bandwidth and not be able to see what, what we're doing. So that being said, I wanted to do something special last night for these type of series because I know that for the rest of the month of September that we're going to be kind of hanging out, at least hopefully a lot of you guys are going to be coming back. So I put a set of guidelines and goals down, and I just want to talk about these really briefly before we go into the other content. So the goals, where do we go from here? I kind of went over that, so that was my first line of exactly where we're going to go. We're going to go talk about a little bit of video today, how to do it. We're going to be more model specific and down the road as far as post-production, shooting setups, applications, stuff like that. Uh, let's see here. Equipment. Again, we always, you know, it's always about the equipment, some people say, but in some other cases, it's not. I try to actually challenge myself to take one or two cameras out, one camera a day, and just try to, one lens, and just try to go there. I'm sure Manny might do the same thing, especially now. Once yeah. <laughs> you're limited where you can go, it's like, let's see what we can drum up. Uh, set light, we're going to talk a little bit because some of you are photographers looking to get into video 
And that's kind of almost, a, that, that's a little bit of a conundrum because photographers a lot of the time, especially those of you that are portrait art, portraitures and aren't doing with a lot of heavy duty stuff, in studio kind of like to work on your own so it's about kind of set life etiquette establishing relationships all that other type of fun stuff so that everything is copacetic again relationships uh workflow we're going to talk about workflow as far as starting from beginning to end to the finished product and how you can deliver uh applications dictate needs i know people often think that you need the latest and greatest but in most cases especially with video, you really don't you can get it's about you know rules are made to be broken here. So we're going to talk about exactly how we can do what loopholes I use, uh, successes and failures on both our parts, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Yes, success and failure, story time. So it, what would any of these sessions be without any type of story time? So that we can show exactly these are times that you do that things don't always go well. <clears throat> We've all embarrassed ourselves on set. Yes. <laughs> I, I was told once, it's like you really cannot succeed without failing. <laughs> and I totally agree with that. That's very, very true. All right. So real quick, let's talk about the models. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the APS-C line. This is the A6000 series for which if, uh, if these weren't around, I probably wouldn't even be here because the A6000 series is the best selling mirrorless system of all time. Sony is the number one in mirrorless right now. Um, it's a bigger pool, obviously. A lot more people are diving in, but we're still trying to, uh, to grow our game. So you have the A6100, 64, and 6600. We can talk about a little of those probably further, a little bit down the road, but we're, it's important to know that these are Super 35 cameras. So they are APS-C. They are not full frame. We're going to talk about in just a second why this is important, okay? Full frame cameras. A lot, most of the time, I'm sure Manny will attest to this, People come and ask me, what the heck is all the difference? I mean, when you come out with between six and nine different cameras in nine years and two years or three years, actually, that have an A7 attached to it or an A9, you want to know what's going on. So really quick, the A7 III is our basic all-around great system. It's You can't go wrong. 24 megapixels, full 4K video. A7 R4 is a high resolution monster, more for portraiture life, 61 megapixels, so it packs a really heavy punch. A7 S3, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second, is our latest and greatest offering, which brings really uh, broadcast video in a, in a very nice small package and a low light monster. So S is for sensitivity. And then of course we, we finalized with A9 II, which is and the A9, which respectively are pretty much our pro sports editorial cameras. They do full frame 4K video as well. Unlike the other guys that they do not have what's known as S-Log, which if you are taking notes, that's another buzzword that we are going to talk about in just a few seconds. But first, the A7S III, uh, that is the best 4K ever. It has not been released. Uh, PhotoCare has had a, a, a a test copy for a few minutes. Manny has checked it out. Yeah. A few other guys. Um, it's going to retail for thirty four ninety nine. It's going to be started shipping and delivering on September twenty fourth. It's already one of the highest pre orders we've ever had in a model. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you can look through it, you hopefully after we get to these classes, you're going to know exactly kind of what a lot of these terms mean. But basically, it's it's twice as fast as anything we've got on any type of uh, sensor and processor. It's got a highly reduced rolling shutter. It's got all 422, 4K internal, all throughout the frame rates, 15 stops of dynamic range. I know I can just keep going, but a lot of you are like, uh, okay. It's a low so, light beast. <laughs> basically, it's a low light beast. It has ISO, for those of you who are looking at the film speed, it's got ISO basically up to 400,000. It is awesome. So uh, native ISO is 100,000, expands up from the 400s but it is incredible. But just think clean six ISO at 16,000. It's incredible, it is game changer. Then we talked about our, our, our one inch sensors, one of which is sitting right next to me. It is the ZV-1, which is situated for most blogging, influencer type stuff. It's a pretty much all in one package with a one inch sensor. So a one inch sensor is smaller than a Super 35 sensor by a bit. So what does this all mean? We're going to talk about it in a second. And now we're going to just, I just want to show you briefly some of our professional line camcorders, which a lot of these cameras that we use up to this point are like, I call like they're like gateway drug cameras. <laughs> so they are, they feed really well. We all work really well together. The reason Sony does is very successful is because you can use any one of our cameras interchanging with these guys and get some, uh, some really professional quality stuff. 
But again, why we're going to talk a little bit why these cameras might work a little bit better than some of the other guys in some applications. But more often than not, you're really not going to depend unless you're on heavy duty, long form, uh, doc, commercial, or uh, you know, a cinematic application. If you need long record times, if you need something that's foolproof on location, in which you only have one take to, to catch it, professional <laughs> camcorders or where it's at. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, so this was, let's just talk about S-Log real quick. So S-Log is the closest that you can get to 17% uh, neutral gray. I shot this actually yesterday. I, like you, a lot of you out there, I have children and children that are home right now, and they go to the playground a lot. So I decided to take the ZV-1 yesterday and maybe try to do a little vlog entry because those are certainly cameras that I don't, I don't use near enough. Um, on vacation, I tend to, but otherwise, like for gigging purposes, I use some of the bigger guns. And like last week, I was shooting a lot with FS7.2, A7.3s, things like that. But this camera really packs a nice punch. This was shot at 960 frames per second in full HD, which this camera can do on a 20.1 megapixel sensor. And what you can see in the split there on the left is kind of what the footage looks like coming out. It looks a little bit dull, less, no contrast, no saturation. And on the back end, it's almost like you know, you, these files are built for editing, almost like raw photo files. So these are, so it's been graded for log. And I'm not going to say this is the greatest SPR that I've ever created. I did it late last night. I, I kind of felt like I wanted to do something new today and just to show you on a real life application what you can do. And this is bright midday sun. So the conditions aren't really what I would call awesome, but I was able to get all the colors and details all I wanted out. It just wasn't are really well, you know, no clouds or anything like that. So it's a little bit stark, but you can show exactly what exactly it can do. So let me see if I can really run through that real quick again. So kind of from a scene and obviously looking at that nice super slow-mo, which is the very sexy thing, the sexy application for most videographers to do nowadays, um, it, it captures very smooth motion. So what you determine as far as frame rate goes, the higher the frame rate, the more smooth the motion, but obviously the more bandwidth, the more bit rate, the more fast, the, you know, the hotter your processor is going to get because it's trying to record all this wonderful data. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it does that. Let me just see if I can keep going here. One mount. It's really important to, to, to understand that all of our camera systems at Sony right now in the mirrorless line, all the way from our interchangeable uh, APS-C line all the way up to the cinema line all do use one mount. So any lens you can retrograde, you can take a Super 35 lens, put it on a full frame camera and it will automatically crop for you. You can take full frame lenses and drop them down. It's just really nice. So you don't really have to worry about what you're putting on anything. It's just, you know, from a photography side, mainly you definitely want to realize that FE is full frame E-mount and then E-mount is Super 35 E-mount. 55, seven native lenses right now. They keep growing, so I'm sure I'll be changing this slide up in the next couple months. Um, it's a flavor for anything you can possibly desire. <clears throat> now we're going to get into some basics. This is kind of the setup that I typically use on my blogging or like classes like these. Actually, today I'm not. I'm just using a nice light, and you know, you see me because um, this is all presentation driven. So you really don't have to look at me that much at all. <laughs> But um, it's totally cableless, my, my system. It, this is usually like an A7 III going through a capture card into an HDMI port into my MacBook and using a system like Zoom or OBS to use and maximize the camera width so I can choose whatever angle I want. Um, I have a lavalier mic that basically slides into a sled that's powered by the Mishu. So what a Mishu is that a lot of our cameras offer is basically a network and an algorithm and, and just power that, that you can transfer data seamlessly without cables. So those of you that run around with a lot of rigs, if any of you do, this could eliminate a lot of the need because especially if you're a neat freak like we, me with some of my gear, I, I really like this less is more of an approach. So Gene, uh, Mishu, sure. that's short for multi-interface shoe, correct? Thank you. Yes, multi-interface you. And on the new A7S III, it's important to know that not only does it transfer power and can data, it actually can kick up some of our mic preamps up to four channels of 24-bit linear audio. So it, it, it's a pro machine. I, I used to say that one of the, the failings, because these cameras, first and foremost, are still imaging, but they do video, they do video very, very well, and audio is a distant third. Now it's taken audio up into the forefront and really just blown it apart. So I'm, I'm very excited about the A7 III in that regard. And that leads us really to this point as far as the still and video cameras, like the interchangeable lens, you know, the difference between professional cam cords and still cameras. I mean, still images 
capture is the primary use form factor and ergonomic suits are usually typically smaller and it's significant compelling video capabilities. So a lot of these are Swiss Army knife cameras that you can use for any type of focal length and capture all types of video from SD, well actually at A4, HD nowadays, HD all the way up to 4K. Uh, then you get to the professional cinema line, which are designed for that. So basically they have audio preamps built in. They have high heat processing engines and fans. They can cool the sensor really quick so you get faster. <clears throat> faster bit rates, things like that. So they, up until recently, you couldn't really do 422 on a full frame sensor until you went to A7S III, which is redesigned heat sink. So it, it's really different as far as your application because you also have run and gun uh, camcorders, which I, Manny, I'm sure you probably use on your career like yeah. I did in sports, which are designed to basically capture an autofocus on tack. You know, I actually, when I first came with an ILC, I totally screwed up. It was with a very, very high-end client that we all know and either love and very much or very much hate right now. <laughs> but I, had, you know, was a I, I, I was doing feature film work, and it was when the 5D twos first came along, and there wasn't a lot of focus assisting out there, <laughs> and so the DP kind of set things up the way he liked. I tried to play with it a little bit, not knowing exactly what I was doing because they were using like two eight lenses and one four lenses and, you know, focus shift for a second and so forth. And certain said celebrity and political figure has really good looking nostril. <laughs> so we have come a long way since then. So in general, the larger the sensor size, look, this is what you need in general, the larger the sensor, the better terms of depth of field sensitivity and dynamic range. So what is a sensor? It's basically a solar panel. It gathers light. That's where we're talking about megapixels. That's why an A7S III has 12 megapixels because they're dinner plate sized pixels. They're designed to, to grab all that light and use it so you can get really clean signal to noise ratio. So the larger the Im image size, the smaller image size, the less depth of field. So the larger the, in the imager, the less noise. The smaller the image sensor, the more noise. So when we talk about noise, we talk about little granules, you know, as far as when heat starts to be incorporated into it comes leaking into the footage and that's like a signal to noise ratio so that you start seeing a lot of grain and where does grain live primarily in the shadows so that's why even exposing video is going to be different that's why dynamic range comes into play and, and it gives you a little bit larger safety net when you're working with what you want to do for a video application so what is 4k at its essence it is basically for it's you know it's it, it's four times the size of high definition <laughs> so so those are you looking at 4k so why would you want to shoot in 4k future proofing cropping and flexibility so basically you can use one camera setup if you're exporting in 1080 like a lot of news outlets still don't even do they still only do they don't even do 720 so they can use a 4k interview shot to basically set up one shot to crop, zoom in, do types of motion, uh, on, usually on post-production, so you can crop and basically create gimbal-like rolls because you have all of that detail still in there that you can zoom in. You can also use panning, so you can look like a camera's on a slider to a degree, and depending on what lens you're using. And obviously, future-proofing, so 10 years down the road, your baby videos are still gonna look good on yeah. TV. Well, it's also, if you're shooting 4K and you're delivering in 1080, downsampled 4K will always look better than a one-to-one -one 1080. You have exactly. more and color to work with. And especially even in handheld. Yeah. So when we're talking about downsampling or cropping for that matter, if you're using a handheld and you really want to look to stabilize your footage more, a proper practice that a lot of people do is usually cropping into Super 35 from 4K so they are full frame in 4K so that you can, everything looks really smooth and stable. So you don't have to add like a warp stabilizer in the back end too much, and or you don't don't have to do much too too much work with it to make it look like, you know, you're like me that drinks four or five cups of coffee a day and <laughs> shakes all the time. <clears throat> What's next? Next, okay, that's kind of ready. <laughs> compression, okay, let's talk about compression. And Manny, maybe you can help me out a little bit with this. Um, yeah. Obviously, people want to know when you're filming in format, especially with your Sony camera, why should I choose XAVCS, XAVCL, XAVCI, or AVCHD? Now, AVCHD is typically the highest form of compression, so it's going to give you the smaller of the image size, but it's also going to retain the least amount of color and detail. And there's going to be a lot of pixel binning. So, what is pixel binning? Manny, you want to help me out with that one? Uh, so, you have a you have a sensor that has a certain amount of resolution. 
it's either going to skip a line or it's going to concatenate all the data into one area of pixels. When you're pixel bending, you lose details. So like we're looking at here in this slide, you're looking on the right hand side, it says ABC HD at 20 megabytes per second. You can see that it's losing detail or it's replicating. It's just finding an area and it's just going to keep replicating those pixels over and over because it's safer. All right, whereas XAVCS or XAVCI tends to grow and capture all of that uh, imaging, you know, so your ripples, you're going to get every individual one, or if you have a campfire, it's not going to replicate flames. It's going to go for every little bit and every little wood chip that sparks off of it. It's going to be, that's, that's the difference. It's going to be the difference in quality. And so it depends really what you're looking to do. And obviously I, I think you have, for this type of application, you also have to look at what type of, what type of imaging source? What are you? What are you? What are you filming for? Are you filming for your phone? <laughs> are you yeah, filming are you, for? Are you shooting for social media, or yeah. are you shooting for a feature? Yeah. So, so you have to keep that in mind when deciding exactly what format you are going to film in. So, the biggest and baddest sometimes isn't always the greatest for you because obviously you're trying to look at computer power on the back end. Can it handle all that footage? Or is ABC HD going to cut it for you? Because a lot of editors now are built, I mean, back in the day, and when I said the day, probably about five or six years ago, ABC HD really wasn't, I mean, even if it's the smallest codec doesn't mean it's the easiest to work with because basically with all that level of compression, when you're working on an editor, unlike in a photo, every time you move your playhead, it's looking to re-render your footage because it has to keep rereading it and re-unpacking re it. So it's because it's always in some type of packet. You know, whereas XAVC is, is a little bit smoother, but yes, it's going to take up more space. Uh, dynamic range. What is it? It's mm -hmm. basically the levels of white to black. You know, how many stops when we talk about, when we talk about, oh, our cameras have 15 stops. Yeah. Our cameras have six, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, when you talk about that, a lot of people's eyes tend to display They're like, what are you talking about? In short, it's really giving you like you're on a tightrope shooting and if you fall off, it's got a much closer, it's a bigger net to cast from. So your glass is a lot more water to work with <laughs> that you can go in and you can fix, you know, because obviously, and Manny maybe agree with me on this, that yeah. editing in video is, is not the same as stills. Absolutely not. Um, I actually editing. like this, to uh, use this as an example, uh, Serena, as a real estate broker, asked, uh, how, you know, using these cameras for, shooting real estate, you're shooting a lot of windows, sometimes very backlit. Mm -hmm. The more dynamic range, the more you, you, you keep your highlights. So if you look like, if you look at the screen, you're blowing out your highlights, which is usually out, like, out, like outdoor light. If you bring it into, into Premiere or uh, was it Final Cut 10, you can knock down your highlights. So you can actually see outside. Exactly. I mean, that's, a, that, that's probably the best point. It's almost like HDR, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, but you have all that detail in, so you can curb it any way you want it. But that's exactly right. Um, and and it, it, exactly. So going down, keep going, keep, so we keep moving a little bit. We can talk a little bit more about the frames per second. We are going to talk about dynamic range more, yeah. but we're just trying to give it through a little bit of basics here right now for this first episode. Uh, the image is basically with frames per second. Just imagine you have a little flip book, and the more pages you have, the more smoother it gets. Okay. So 24p, that's almost like cinematic video, but it's skipping, so it looks really kind of more dramatic, whereas 60p and 30p, and p meaning progressive frames, and there's 24p, gives it a little bit more of a smoother look, so that when you slow down, you can slow it down like everyone wants to do, the next Michael Bay film, and you do your little bullet cams like The Matrix, that type of thing, and make it look a lot more cohesive, whereas in 24, it's going to stagger a little bit. But some people like that a little bit more. It's just a matter of what you're looking for. <clears throat> Rec 709. This is one of those things I think we really want to emphasize because people are like, what? Rec 709 is the universe. It's a, basically a, a picture, a, a game of curve, actually, and a list of colors that the United Nations use so that if I'm watching Seinfeld in the U.S., that it's going to look exactly the same if I fly to Japan. So it's a set color ratio that you basically you adhere to so that when you're filming and editing, you can basically put a lookup table on top of that to make sure that it's broadcast safe. Now, 709 is a full HD format. What we're looking at now with Rec 2020 
is about 1,800 more different shades of red, green, and blue. So that, that triangle is expanding for 4K. So now that people are broadcasting in 4K. And that's pretty important to understand because understanding why you film and log, why you have, you know, because you want to make sure that the monitor, when you're, okay, it looks great on my monitor. You want to make sure it looks great on everybody's monitor. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so many high-end calibration tools out there for people to, to put forth. And obviously with the internet, I mean, I, 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 in fact, I double check on my phone all the time. I'll export, make sure how's it look on my iPhone? How's it look on this computer? Just because I'm always guess, second guessing myself on, on what people want to look at. Camera setup, yay, video modes. So obviously on the top of your camera or in, yeah, in most of the cases, unless you're using like the RX100s of the ZV series, you're gonna have a top dial that's gonna show you different modes. Obviously in, when you're recording video, it really is important for you to look at that little film strip ahead and not just point, you not just use the record button on the back of your camera, but you definitely wanna shift over there to that tab and make sure that your shutter speed is gonna be more cohesive than where it was on a still frame. And what I mean by that is what, Manny, what's the reciprocating factor of shutter speed versus frame rate? Half. So if you're shooting 60 frames per second, 120. Exactly. <laughs> so if you want 24 frames per second, most cameras don't do 48. So stick to 50, which is the closest reciprocal value. Exactly. So if you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, write that down because if you're not familiar with this, and people that are so scared to do video, one of the things that probably would scare them away from that is not having really a correct shutter speed. And in some regards, it's very simple. But so many of us are using these cameras for still imaging that you don't take into consideration that a thousandth of a second is not going to look very good <laughs> on, some, on some shades of video. And yet what will happen is you'll get little artifacting or if you do any type of motion, it's just going to jitter. You know, So it doesn't, even though the exposure might be correct, you are not using it. So that's why it's important, and we'll talk about this again during another one, what the importance of like ND filters. Some of our cameras have them on board, mm -hmm. some don't. Most of them don't. But using ND filters on top of your ones to cut down like a lot of outdoor sun shooting so you can get that bokeh, which is that wide aperture shooting. So in basically, I don't know what, at 1.4 to F4, you get a really nice soft defocusing background, which is what everyone seems to want nowadays, you know, in addition to fast frame rates you know, to pretty much get that sexy looking color because if you're doing your blog and you have a lot of clothes piled up in the corner in the back or you have, <laughs> you know, it's just garbage in the background, you want to defocus yeah. and make it look good, you know, instead of like, what the hell are they, what are they reading back there? You know, being able to see your full CD collection and so forth. One thing that is important that I think, especially for those of you that aren't really comfortable because with autofocusing, which has come a long way, I don't know how you feel about that, Manny, but I used to be full on board with manual focusing. I didn't trust anything, and now I it's still like, am. <laughs> it's I, I will say that the A7S III may change that for me. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you're looking at advanced form focus sits where the contrast points are everything in focus. Pretty much, you're able to look at, you know, your C on your viewfinder. It's like, what is that red? So it's red, yellow, white, blue, certain colors you can choose, and different levels of contrast to what is in focus. So those of you that you're trying to use your nice 35-1-4 out there and you're like, oh, they look in focus on the back of my screen and then you get them to the big screen on your video and or on your TV and it looks like crap and they have a great looking nose or whatever. Why didn't I, you know, why isn't that in focus? Well, focus assist is absolutely pivotal, especially if you use cinema lenses, different things without any focusing motors, or if you're using third-party glass in your Sony system because obviously the best lenses for focusing and especially eye autofocusing are our own native glass. So focus peaking is a huge factor. It's certainly something that has come quite a long way in the past four or five years, because even that wasn't a total magic bullet. Now in sports, it's probably not the best thing to the application because things are moving around and so forth and you don't want your lens barrel pulling around, but it's a surefire way to make sure that yes, I have this in focus. And the way that you usually set it up basically in one of our camera menu systems is there will be a tab and, and under it you will go onto the peaking setting, peaking, peaking setting. And it's usually under a focus assist. <clears throat> Excuse me, a focus assist tab. Sound good? Tips and tricks, a focus magnifier. I don't really want to go too much into because that's kind of at least a little bit what we were doing. Um, you can dial in a, a button on the camera to punch in while yes. you're shooting. So you can really dial in your focus to make sure that 
what you're seeing is accurate. Right. Or you can have it so that if you rotate the manual focus barrel, it'll punch in automatically. Exactly. So your focus magnification is going to be certainly, usually, again, with third-party glass where you don't have any manual focus, for those of you just heard, that is my daughter who just <laughs> got home. Apparently, they were playing with some silly string. So she may make a cameo appearance. I'm sorry, but she is cute. Um, the focus magnifier also, you can actually basically call some, it's called clear image zoom. So basically almost every single lens of ours, you can effectively double the focal length with minimal image or any type of data loss by just programming a button in. And that's also awesome. So if you have a 35 millimeter lens and at some point you need to get a 60, you need to double it up, you need all okay, candy 60 or 70, you can actually go in, dial that in really quick mm -hmm. and get a nice shot and pound. It's basically making every lens a Swiss army knife. That's one of the advantages of the higher resolution Sony cameras. Right. Yeah, especially, well, you know, not even just the higher resolution Sony cameras. I mean, the A7S III does it really well, and that's called my pixel. Because remember, remember, camera data uh, from a still imaging side and video is, is, is not the same. So 61 megapixels on a video is like, it doesn't really matter. In fact, 61 megapixels on video actually is kind of prohibitive just due to the fact that it's not as good in lower light situations as like a 24 megapixel camera. Gotcha. Makes sense? Yes, it does. Yay. Zebras. Zebras are also something that drop down from the pro signal line that basically look at you, you know, be like, hey, the brightness level, this needs to come down. Um, so it kind of helps you out with along with like what's known as a histogram to show you what's blowing out in proportion components. So you can look at your scene and you can look at your darkest setting and what your white so if your waves obviously crashing the background, those are naturally going to be a little bit more blown out just because those crests are white. But you obviously don't that want the specular highlights in the face to be blown out because that means your data is lost. <laughs> and when you try to edit with it, it's not going to go very well for you. <laughs> so the moral of the story is don't look at the visual part of your screen. Look at the data that's being represented through it. Right. Because these, these, the screens on the back of a camera are not color accurate and they're low resolution. So exactly. use, use the focus assist tools and the exposure assist tools to exactly. make sure you nail it. Exactly. <clears throat> because once you don't get that shot, it's going to be really hard to get back, especially if you are at a paid gig. And having the one to break that news to anybody is the worst feeling in the world. Oh, boy. Also, uh, probably, how are we doing on time? Do we have enough for this? or do we have oh, to go It's 2.35 now. Um, picture profiles are good. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. So picture profiles, yay. So depending on your camera, more than likely whatever camera you have of ours, unless it's the A9 series, you do have picture profiles. So even the ZV-1 RX100 series, they have picture profiles. When you look at them, you're like, boy, what are all these list of things, one through 10? Well, basically what those are, are those are different gamma curves. So what they are, are different kind of color flat, flatteners or cine looks that you can program in to make sure to maximize the dynamic range off the sensor. And obviously we talked about one of them earlier, which is S-Log2, or I mean S-Log3, but there's also S-Log2, which is a bit, a little bit about, probably about 14 stops, 13 stops, and then S-Log3 in our newer cameras is 15 stops. But sometimes S-Log2 is just fun to work with. A lot of news networks actually for us use picture profile number four, uh, which is, let me go find this. I want to see where the list is. Okay, there it is. This is good. This is actually online. So yeah. it's our site. You can check it out. I highly encourage anyone that wants to learn anything about picture profiles because a lot of people don't use them because they are kind of complicated. Um, it, unless you really want to tweak every little bit of your image, I encourage you pretty much just to use the standard profiles. Yeah. But picture profile four is, Cine 4 is pretty much, what's called Cine 4 is basically what a lot of people, networks and studios use because it's really faithful to color tones and it has a good 7, rock 709 look to it. So it kind of shows you better off like what you're going to be getting off in the back end for any type of broadcast work. But if you need to screenshot, you should screenshot that one because you're going to go back and look, what? And now down the line, actually, because again, with picture profile 10, that is HLG, so much like HDR video. So if you have a nice HDR TV, anything that you film in there, if you want to plug it into your TV, you can it'll interpret it, interpolate it really well. Whereas in a computer, if you're editing, not so much. You're going to have to use an, H, an HDR log file on it to make it look any what useful. Because then you are going to be looking at it going, this looks terrible. Yeah. But that's I, I will stress though, if you start getting into hybrid log gamma or HDR content, you will need more expensive monitors higher grade monitors yeah. that can actually interpret the brightness and, and get the colors accurate. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, 
I, I can't tell you enough about that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we don't, let's just uh, do that later. We have questions. Think, yeah, we, uh, well, we have a really good one. Uh, David Field is asking, what's the color sub, uh, what's the color subsampling specs on the A7S III? Subsampling specs in regards to, I mean, it's 422, so you get 1056. So you get over to tag, you get over 1056 different shades of red, green, and blue. So it's 10 bit 422. Um, yeah, so it's 10 bit 422. But with the addition of the USB, uh, the new SBP or the new H type A HDMI port is going to output 16 bit raw. So I don't know exactly the color palette that that actually is going to hold. But that is going to be somewhat, that is going to be more substantial. But obviously, our friends over at Atmos are working on that. Yeah. Well, I will say though, if they're doing ProRes RAW, 16-bit to Ninja 5, that's higher than any other camera manufacturer right now. Everyone else is doing 12-bit. The 16-bit, I'm, I'm just trying to replicate for my, because basically 8-bit into 10-bit is over two times the amount of colors. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's four times the amount of colors because it's 200, is it 256 shades of red, green, blue, 8. Yeah. You're in the billions 10, at this 6, point. And 10-bit. <laughs> So multi keep multiplying that is just going to be substantial, and I can't wait because my Ninja Five is chopping to the bit to get a get a load of that. Yeah. So I can't wait for the new firmware to come out, and I'm going to eat it up because <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be ridiculous. Um, I've already shot long with it, but not say obviously 16 bit we can't do yet. All right, um, everyone, please uh, ask more questions if you can, please. All right, uh, Gene, mm. just waiting for more questions. You want to teach him anything else? Yeah, sure. White balance, baby. Uh, yes. <laughs> Let me like find that because white, white monitor brightness. No, no white there balance. Is white more, balance. Yeah. I mean, white balance is absolutely key. I don't care if you were in raw. I mean, if you're in S log, I, I encourage you actually, if you want to print out a copy of this slide and use this, the, the gray in the background as your gray card, just do it. <laughs> because once you set that white balance and we get it, if you don't get what you want, it's going to take forever and a day just to get something that's going to be acceptable for you. So I try, especially in video that you're using multiple, if you're using multiple cameras, if you're using different types of sets, different lights, outdoors versus indoors, you want to make sure that you've got a gray card with you. I mean, I was on a shoot a location. I was doing a location shooting and studio shooting on last Friday. And I, I'm with three different cameras and setting up that white, if I didn't have that white balance, I, I can't even tell you, I probably wouldn't even be here right now. I would be cutting because I was so frustrated. I'd be so frustrated. And we've all been there. But obviously with the white balance, what I'm saying with a great card is you have custom, you have customization. So you can set a custom white balance for yourself where you can basically plug in, you can either dial in your favorite Kelvin temperature. So those of you that have lights and you have daylight or studio lighting, you can dial that in for, color, for appropriate color temperature, or you can go ahead and use any type of scene like a gray card, and you can basically use the center button and, and, and kick it in and basically use the center click and go to town and tile, dial in your custom balance. So, so um, let's see here. Autofocusing, we talked about autofocusing at some point. So face detection, a lot of our cameras now have face detection. It's almost like a different form of autofocusing. It's an AI algorithm that basically lets you, memorizes contrast points, knows it is eyes. It's not like the Terminator or anything like that, but basically what it is, it's memorizing features so that you can basically lock on on a subject um, and basically the A6400, the A92, the A7R4, maybe the A7R3, I forgot, sorry, the ZV1, the A7S3, blah, blah, blah. And it is just going to track right to left coming any type of focal plane, and it is just going to tack focus. I, 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 I can't tell you how impressed I am with that. Um, it's certainly something that, you know, if you saw one of my classes two or three years ago for Sony, I probably wouldn't have been such a huge, I wouldn't be gushing over it. I mean, it autofocused, it autofocused pretty darn well for a cinema camera. You know, obviously we come from school where we're, we're dialing things in manually and trusting any type of machine to do it is, is, is hard to do, especially because it's your shot, it's not the machines. But it, it, it's absolutely amazing what these cameras can do. Um, I don't know if you saw, my kids kind of ran in here real quick till I shoot them out. But I mean, having a track, being able to track that is, <laughs> I'm, just, 
I have to keep going over every shot with a focus. Like, did he really take that? I mean, I can shoot him through glass. I can do anything. One thing it's learning to do right now that we're still it, it is with masks. Masks are certainly something that's that, that that's something that that we have to to go a little bit. For. Everybody does because I don't think anyone <laughs> playing on a pandemic <laughs> being like, oh, I have no nose now. What, what is this? Is this a human face? Because now we can do animal eye out of focus. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's just something that, that you just kind of grow with. But, uh, but firmware, obviously, we're always coming out with newer stuff. So it's, it, it's really wicked, especially those of you that are gigging uh, event style, uh, weddings, fashion type of thing. This is definitely for you because your subjects are always changing. And racking focus is not always something that you're gonna, is going to be on your mind with that. So this allows you to really focus on composition instead of just, oh, my God, did I get this in focus? You know, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Yeah. It's always it's a little bit more about that. And just because we're doing all of this, we have like all these awesome modes. Don't don't forget about manual focus. Sometimes no. it's the right tool for the job. Yeah, but when you have six hundred ninety three or seven hundred fifty seven phase detection points covering ninety two percent coverage, you're sorry, yeah. you're it's kind of hard to overlook that. Now that being said, obviously, I mean, we can talk about you know cinema glass. Which, why do you use cinema glass? I mean, the trend in what's a T versus an F? You know, a T is versus a transmission speed versus an F stop. So a T is, transmission stops are absolute. You know, F stops are, eh, you know, your F2 might be not be my F2. Whereas if you see transmission stop on a cine glass, it's kind of what you're paying for. Yeah. I think that's so, something that we should talk about in a later class. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> no, for sure. That look right. quite good. Um, I think... Uh... I think that's I think that's all for today. That's that covered pretty much the basics. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I will. I do want to kind of focus. Sorry, pardon. Sure, go for it. Go for it. As far as the tips, as far as this goes, and and our cameras are programmed out of the box. Some people are like, well, why is my focus drifting over here? You know, wide area focus is normally programmed into your camera. Um, obviously, now they're coming with eye autofocus. So you want to make sure that. For a constant focus area, you want to make sure that one key is in AFSC mode. Sorry, AFS for single shot basically means it's for portraits. It's a set scene; people aren't moving around. Whereas AFC is for is continuous, so the, the camera is continuously focusing. It's trying to track its subjects. Now, for eye autofocus and face detection, right now, which I would never have said probably again two years ago is wide area focus. I really is not a fan of wide area focus because what it tends to do is to focus on the object that is closest to the camera, which it does, it does very well. But in certain things, if I want my blue cup to be focused because that's in center, why is my orange cup focused? You know, it's because it's closer to the camera. So the same rule applies to different types of subjects and humans or animals for that matter. So when you're using that, you know, now with face detection on, it's always looking for the face. So it picks things out and it, and it, or eye autofocusing and it does it uh, obviously very, very well. We just won an award for it. So it, it's, it does it very well, but obviously you can do touch tracking now on, on, on some of our cameras. The a7S three has a touch menu system, touch shoot. So it, 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 we're getting there where as far as, you know, as far as we never tend to over promise under deliver all of our stuff works really well so it's been it's been a real joy to get to know a lot of these cameras <clears throat> so any more questions or uh, you could so imac is asking which is the resolution output of the a7r2 Whew. Uh, well i mean it's uh 4k remember, out it's, it's 4K, 4k out it was 36 megapixels yeah well, was, 30, was it 8 yeah. bit out uh it was <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is, I have to go back and I have to go back to one of my other. Yes, actually, no. Um, it is 8 bit out, but it resamples to 10 bit in Atmos or your other type of recorder using a micro HDMI cable. So it is not true 10 bit. Uh, it will record a 10 bit, like a 10 bit recording of an 8 bit file, if that makes any sense. So basically, the 10 bit recorder is replicating all those pixels and trying to make different colors out of it. And it makes it easier to use. That's when I first started, because actually, my first, I think my first camera for Sony was A7 II. And then obviously, the A7R2, I, I gigged with quite a bit, usually on the skill side. But on the video, I did have a Ninja 2 that I used with that. And it, and it would work pretty well, but you know, it wasn't true 10 bit at the time. That's a really good question because that brings it back to the day and it's kind of like it's off exactly where you came from and 
and how far we've come, you know. Yeah, so, especially in the past like three years, it's been yeah, it's like, just been stop like, innovation. But again, you have to keep up. You know, the competition is out there. So, yeah. you know, we used to be the big fish in the small pond. The other guys were like mirrorless won't last, blah blah blah. And then oh, okay, well, it does last. This is what everyone's going to go into. So we have to keep upping our game. And luckily, we're you know in some cases four to five generations in, and it's just uh, you know it, it, it kind of keeps climbing. So I know that there are certain things down the pipeline for the rest of 2020. And obviously with the the area that we're in as far as the pandemic goes and being where we need to be as far as helping educate people from the video side because everyone wants to vlog now <laughs> and, and webcam. I mean, so you have great cameras that you can buy the ZV-1 for under 700 and, you know, 50 bucks or whatever. Yeah. You know, and which comes with amazing little microphone and, um, here, I'll stop sharing this real quick. Let me see here. So you deal with a camera like the ZV-1 where it comes with a nice little like, directional microphone, which does kick out the noise, the ambient, really well. I mean, I was in a playground yesterday with streaming kids, and this worked remarkably well. I mean, the full-out art articulating screen, so for those of us, and then uh, tracking focus. I mean, I had a blast with it yesterday. Um, I felt really giddy with it. And it does S-Log3. It does HLG, so it has all wonderful picture profiles and this color science of all these higher end cameras in this one inch sensor so that it can really deliver and be an accessible, you know, either a B camera yeah. or anything like that for some of the other guys. I mean, I haven't output to a ninja yet, but I probably should. I'd like yeah. to try it out. It definitely punches above its weight. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Uh, with all that being said, I think uh, we should wrap this one up. Great. I'm Great. going to actually remind everyone that we have a few events coming up uh, this Thursday. We have an art box from Phil to Studio with Richie Myers. That's going to be a really fun one, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, then we have next Tuesday another one with uh, Gene for Sony, week two Sony A7 series cinematic setups for the masses. Then the following Tuesday would be week three uh, slow, quick motion shooting and, and post, and week four is putting proper practice application, shooting, editing, and delivering. So, it's so extreme. And actually, I think I'll have an A7S3 at that point to show off. So, or back in the house. So, we'll be, yeah. I, it may be next week. So, we'll maybe bring that in here just for a quick cameo visit. Yeah. Um, make sure to visit our, you know, our photo care event page. And uh, the more information we'll get about the Sony S3, we'll keep everyone on, uh, on notice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you. And remember, support photo care. Pre -order taking pre-orders pre <laughs> uh, they've got stock we've been uh, i've been really trying to make sure and keep my eye on them and they've got everything and manny obviously is is super talented and such an amazing filmmaker you should watch appreciate it, it. <laughs> but he, he definitely knows his stuff and he is the in-house video guy for photo care as well so yeah. you know he will point you in the right direction all right Thank you. Uh, so if anyone wants to do pre-orders, sales at photocare.com. If you have any questions, uh, support at photocare.com. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Gene, thank you so much. You're awesome as always. Hey. See you next Tuesday. All right, see you, buddy. Bye. Take care.